On the 30th of August, 2013, Karen Las Pisa got a call from her 19-year-old son, telling her that he had a lot to talk about when he got home. But Karen would never get the chance to have that conversation. She would never hear from him again. Bryce would disappear into thin air. More than seven years have passed, and the evidence leading up to his disappearance continue to baffle his family, friends, and investigators. This is the case of Bryce Las Pisa. Bryce Las Pisa was born on April 30th, 1994, and raised by his loving parents, Karen and Michael Las Pisa, in Illinois. Growing up, he attended Kingsley Elementary School, Lincoln Junior High School, and graduated from Naperville Central High School in 2012. Bryce was described by his family and friends as a happy and funny guy who would light up the room whenever he walked in. He was a talented artist, a good student, and played football and baseball. Shortly after Bryce's graduation, Michael and Karen retired and decided to move from their home in Illinois to Laguna Niguel, California. Bryce would apply for and was accepted into Sierra College, a community college in Rockland, California that was located seven hours away from his parents' home in Laguna Niguel. To start his college experience, he moved to Rockland, where he was about to start his freshman year of study. Bryce chose to study graphic and industrial design. Everything seemed to be going well for Bryce in Rockland. He had a great freshman year at the college. He made a few friends and was good friends with his roommate, Sean Dixon. He had also started dating a girl named Kim Sly. During the summer break, Bryce spent some time with his parents in Laguna Niguel. His family said that he was happy and was looking forward to returning to college to resume his classes. Bryce would return to college for his sophomore year a few weeks before his class would start. Something would change for Bryce after his return from summer break, though. Bryce's friends began to notice a shift in his behavior. His roommate, Sean, reported that Bryce had been acting strange. He had been heavily drinking since his return and said that on weekends he would finish two-fifths of hard alcohol by himself. On August 26, 2013, Bryce attended his first round of classes and later called his mother, Karen, to tell her that it went well. His mother said that nothing seemed to be out of place and said that they had a good, normal conversation. The next day, on the 27th of August, Bryce started to act extremely strange and admitted to his girlfriend, Kim, that he had been taking ADHD medication that was not prescribed to him. Sean said that Bryce had been taking Vyvanse to help him stay awake to play video games all night. Later in the day, Bryce gave away some of his belongings to his friends, including diamond earrings gifted to him by his mother and his precious Xbox. Later that night, Bryce also broke up with his girlfriend over text, saying that she would be better off without him. The next day, on the 28th of August, Sean called Bryce's mother and told her that Bryce was acting strange and that he was very concerned about him. He also said that Bryce indicated that something was troubling him but never explained what it was. That day, Bryce went to Kim's apartment in Chico, which was about a two hours drive from his apartment. At 10 p.m., Bryce called his mother and told her that Kim wouldn't give him back his car keys and that she wouldn't let him leave. Kim spoke to Karen on the phone and told her that Bryce was acting strange and she didn't think he should be driving in this condition. Karen then talked to Bryce and offered to fly out to see him the next day, to which Bryce responded, quote, No, don't make an airline reservation until I talk to you because I have a lot to talk to you about. He insisted that he was fine. Karen asked Kim to return him his car keys, but only if he promised to call her in the morning. Bryce left Kim's apartment around 11.30 p.m. At 1 a.m. on August 29th, Bryce called Karen and she missed the call. When Karen saw the missed call, she assumed that Bryce had called her to let her know that he had made it to his apartment safely. She would find out later in the investigation that cell towers placed him one hour away from his apartment in an isolated area when he had made that call. Later in the morning, at around 11 a.m., Bryce's parents received a voicemail from their auto insurance company stating that Bryce had used their roadside assistance plan at 9 a.m. His parents tried calling Bryce, but he didn't pick up his phone. Concerned, they called Bryce's roommate, Sean, who told them that Bryce never came home the previous night. 
His parents then checked and found out that Bryce had charged $20 worth of fuel on their credit card from Castro Tire and Truck in Button Willow, California. Button Willow is about three hours away from his parents' house in Laguna Niguel, so Karen and Michael assumed that Bryce was on his way to visit them. They called Bryce several times, but he didn't pick up his phone. Since Bryce bought gas around 9 a.m. and Laguna Niguel was only three hours away, Karen and Michael became concerned when he did not arrive back home by 12 p.m. Karen called the Castro Tire and Truck and talked to a man named Christian. Christian told her that Bryce had run out of gas and he was called to deliver him about three gallons of gas. Karen told Christian that Bryce wasn't answering his phone and that she was very concerned for him. Christian offered to go back and see if he could find Bryce in the area. When Christian arrived, to his surprise, he found Bryce still sitting in his car, in the exact same spot where he had left him hours earlier. Around 12.30 p.m., Christian called Karen and told her Bryce seemed okay, though his eyes were a bit red. Christian put Bryce on the phone, who told his mother that nothing was wrong. Karen told Bryce to come home, to which he agreed and hung up the phone. His parents expected Bryce to be home by 3 p.m., however, he never showed up. They tried calling him multiple times, but he didn't pick up any of the calls. Around 6 p.m., his parents filed a missing persons report with the Orange County Sheriff's Office. The police pinged Bryce's phone and found out that he was still in Button Willow. Moreover, in the last nine hours, he had only moved eight miles from where he was previously found. Soon, police in the area found him sitting in his car on the side of the road on Lagoon Drive in Button Willow. The police searched his car for drugs, but did not find anything. The police did a sobriety test, which he passed. When the police asked him what he was doing, he said that he was just blowing off some steam. The police spent 20 minutes talking to Bryce, and to them, he seemed completely fine. He was talkative and was replying to questions normally. The officers asked him to call his parents as they were very worried, but to their dismay, Bryce was reluctant. The police then dialed Bryce's parents for him and put him on the phone. Karen asked Bryce what he was doing. Bryce simply said that he was putting stuff back in his car after the search. Karen again said, what are you doing? You've been in the same area for more than nine hours. Get some food and come home. Some sources claim that Bryce had said that he was going to hang out with friends later. That would explain why he was in Button Willow for so long, but who these friends were has never been identified. Karen asked the officers if Bryce was okay to drive and they said he was perfectly fine. The officers left him to make his way home. Later that evening, Christian, from Castro Tire and Truck, called Karen after seeing a missed call from her a few hours prior. Karen explained the situation to him. Christian offered to go check on Bryce again, but Karen told him he didn't have to as Bryce was most likely on his way home by now. Christian went to check anyway. When he arrived to the area where Bryce was last seen, he found Bryce in the same spot, sitting in his car. Christian offered to follow Bryce until he was on the freeway on his way home. After 30 minutes, Christian left Bryce on the freeway and headed back. He told Karen that Bryce was on his way home now. Over the next couple of hours, Bryce and his parents exchanged several phone calls. Karen asked him to name any landmarks or street signs he saw. He said he didn't see any, but said that his GPS said he would be home by 3.25 a.m. At around 2 a.m., Bryce called Karen and told her that he was too tired to keep driving and that he was going to pull over, sleep for a couple of hours, and then get back on the road. At this point, Bryce had been awake for a minimum of 24 hours. His parents agreed that he should pull over and get some sleep. This would be the last time they would hear from him. That morning at 8 a.m., the Las Pisa family's doorbell rang. Bryce's parents expected it to be Bryce, but when they opened the door, they found a California Highway Patrol officer standing in front of them. The officer asked whether they owned a 2003 beige Toyota Highlander. The Las Pisas told the officer that their son had been driving that car. The officer informed them that at 5.30 a.m. that morning, the vehicle had been found overturned and abandoned in Castaic Lake off an access road to the state recreation area about two hours north of the family's home. He told them the vehicle had been crashed and was found on its side at the bottom of a 25-foot embankment at the base of a steep hill. He also said that the back window of the car had been broken from the inside and they believed that Bryce was inside the vehicle at the time of the crash and pushed his way out of the car. His laptop and phone were found in the car while his duffel bag and wallet were outside, near the rear window. Only small amounts of Bryce's blood were found on the passenger side headrest and in the back seat, suggesting that Bryce wasn't seriously injured. 
An examination of the crime scene suggested that, for unknown reasons, Bryce drove off the service road into a rest area, along a cell tower, and toward the lake. The cell tower is at the top of the embankment, and there were tire marks from the cell tower to the bottom of the embankment where the vehicle was found. Investigating the tire tracks and the area, police were able to assume that, while going down the embankment, Bryce had accelerated and sped up instead of hitting the brakes. This suggested to investigators that Bryce may have been wanting to take his own life by driving his car into the Castaic Lake, but the vehicle flipped before it could reach the lake. Police conducted a large-scale investigation of the area, consisting of hundreds of volunteers, helicopters, divers, and ATVs, but no sign of Bryce would turn up. Then, on September 4th, 2013, a jogger called 911 to report a brush fire just three miles from where Bryce's car was found. When the firefighters arrived at the scene, they discovered the cause of the fire to be a burning body. However, the body was later determined to be of an L.A. man who had been a victim of a homicide. On the ninth day of the search, bloodhounds were brought in, and they tracked Bryce's scent from the car, over a road, and toward a truck stop, but this is where the scent ended. Police obtained some CCTV images from the area. The still images taken from the camera showed Bryce's car going up the hill at 2.15 a.m., just six minutes after he told his mother he was too tired and was going to pull over and sleep. However, just one hour before his crashed car was found, at 4.29 a.m., the same camera on the same hill captured a picture of Bryce's car going back up the hill again. No one knows what Bryce was doing in that area. After weeks of exhaustive searching, the search was called off. According to investigators, there is no evidence to suggest that foul play was involved or that Bryce had died of suicide. Police talked to Kim, Sean, and his friends. They found out that the same night that Bryce had left, he had sent Sean a text message that read, quote, I love you, bro. Seriously, you're the best person I've ever met and you've saved my soul. While being interviewed, Sean said that he really didn't think Bryce was leaving forever. Investigators believe that Bryce willingly walked away from his current life, but his family does not agree with this, stating that they were very close and that there is just no way Bryce would leave them without contact for seven years. In the years following, Bryce's parents have continued to search for their missing son. In 2015, they hired a sonar boat and searched the lake for two days. However, nothing would turn up. Bryce has been missing for more than seven years now, and with no leads and no signs, Bryce's case remains unsolved. <laughs>